Welcome to our third chapter of Pure K of Oak. We are getting through this. We're gonna concentrate on Mishnahs one through nine. Let's go. You already know, we are dedicating this to the memory of Rav Bernstein, Rav Stephen Bernstein and my mother, Iris Elizabeth Roke. May their memories be for a blessing. And if you have someone you'd like to dedicate this study to, because that's what we do when we do studies, we dedicate in someone's memory or in someone's honor if they're still alive. Um, we just changed the ending a little bit, but go ahead and say the name of the one you want to dedicate this to. May their memories be for a blessing. Let's go. All right. So as you know, we are using the Pure Cable uh, Masechet from uh, safaria.org. And please, please, please donate to Safari. If you got a few dollars, give to them. They're providing a free platform um, where we can get all these resources. Most of the time, the stuff is in English. Um, give them some... Give them some donation if you can. Uh, from the safari.org pure care vote, we're using the new Israeli commentary. Not so much anymore. We did more so in the beginning, but now we're really sticking to the rap Bartonura. And every once in a while, we'll use the English, um, I forget how it's called, the English commentary. You can't miss it when you start using the safari.org. And of course, we can't forget our Sforno, pure care vote with Sforno com commentary written by Rabbi Raphael. Pelkovitz, this is a lifesaver. Um, I want to say this book is about $20, 20, $20, $25 on Art Scroll. Um, it is a gem to have. It's made for uh, people that really don't have a lot of experience with the the uh, Talmud or the Mishnah. Let's say the Mishnah. Uh, so it's kind of made for that. It's. Um, I would definitely recommend this. And some people want to have a book in your hand, like me. Okay. We are starting chapter three, so you know what we're going to do. We're going to read, All Israel has a share in the world to come, as it is said, and your people are righteous. They shall inherit the land forever. They are a branch of my planting, my handiwork in which to take pride. Okay. So let's start with Mishnah 3 1. Now, this name here. Akabia, you will hear as Akiva, but in the uh, Sephardi, Middle Eastern Hebrew, the bet stays a, stays a bet and it doesn't change to a vet. So they don't say Akiva, they say Ak, Ak, I can't even say it, Akabia. <laughs> Akabia, Akiva, Akabia, Akibia, Ak I don't know. But that's what that's why that but that is Akiva. Ben Mahalalel, oh Lord. Akabia Ben Mahalalel said, Mark well three things, and you will not come into the power of sin. Know from where you come and where you're going, and before whom you are destined to give an account and a reckoning. From where do you come? From a putrid drop. <laughs> where are you going? To a place of dust, of worm and maggot. Before whom you are destined to give an account and reckoning before the King of Kings and the Holy One, blessed be he. Now, this is not the first time we heard about these worms and maggots. We've already heard them in the first chapter, I believe. So we're kind of getting used to that plain talk that the sages give us. Okay, so let's see. Uh, the English the English explanation of Pierre Cavill, and that's what I was talking about for um, safaria.org, the English explanations. Uh, I'm not sure what, if that commentary is called the English Explanations of Pure Kavod or what, but... Um, and they're the ones that pointed out that his name is Akiva in, I guess, uh, other circles instead of Akib, uh, what we said earlier. So they're introducing Akiva or Ak Akabia ben Mahalalel, that he lived in the time of Hillel. Ooh, try saying that fast. Ak Akabia ben Mahalalel lived in Hillel. <laughs> <laughs> he lived in the time of Hillel before the destruction of the temple. We learned about the conflicts that this sage had with other sages in Edu Yoth, uh, chapter 5, verses 6 through 7. So, um, there we go. Now, Sforno wants to jump in on this. Mark three things 
uh, Mark well three things and you will not come into the power of sin. He said, consider and you will not come into the grip of sin. Know whence you came and whether you go. It's proper that you contemplate the origin of your being and its culmination, be it regarding the physical aspect of man or the intellectual one. Now, behold, the physical part of man, both its beginning and its end, is loathsome and perishable. Therefore, it's not fitting to exert one's energies in its pursuit. The intellectual element, however, can be good or beneficial or, conversely, evil according to man's endeavors in this realm, as it is judged by the Holy King. Therefore, one must make efforts to succeed in his attempts in the intellectual realm and use caution to avoid that which may prevent him from its attainment, so that he may be found meritorious, uh, excuse me, meritorious when judged from on high. As a result of this contemplation, you will not come into the grip of sin, for you will not pursue the gratification of your physical desires. Instead, you will attempt to succeed in refining and improving your intellectual abilities, which are permanent, so that you will, you will merit to be found worthy on the day of your reckoning before the King of Kings. And um, let's see if I can pull. I'm reading a book right now, and I will. Well, I'm always reading. I'm reading several books <laughs> at all times. Um, but this one, I'll be doing a review on it. It's called Foundation of Fear. It's a Musar. Musar is an ethical uh, work. Just like Pierre Cabo, it's about ethical character building. And uh, it comes from a group I belong to called the Habara, which I will talk about as well. I highly recommend this, and I will tell you why. But this particular book speaks about the idea of um, building your character in a systematic way it's not something you can just acquire it has to, you have to pursue it just how we see from the sages always talking about torah study set aside a time for torah study and stick to your schedule it's actually saying the same thing about reading things of musar um things that will uh share with you in uh um, ethical um pursuits and then incorporate them into your life slowly but surely so i'll be talking about that because that's huge but that's what we're doing here with Pierre Kavot. And I think that's why Rab Bernstein always had us read it once a year because Musar is huge, especially for those of us in Western thought. Um, the, um, the disciples of Yeshua often, uh, when you read their letters, they're pointing out, because we don't know the Torah offhand, like uh, we are encouraged to learn it. But how do you get somebody to kind of snap into um, the ways of how the Jews are moving without... Uh, you know, they don't have the opportunity to yet fully come into Torah. Um, you're going to do that with Musar, with character building. First thing you got to do is change the way they live, how they see the world, their relationship between man and man, and their relationship between the new, lo new, new, the new God they just um, decided to follow, Hashem. So Musar is huge. Shout out to Musar. Okay. So we have from, um, we have now, mark well three things that you will not come into, so that you don't come into the power of sin. Know from where you come, where you're going, and before whom you are destined to give an account and reckoning. Um, so from where you come, you come from a putrid drop. What is this putrid drop? Rab Bartonora wants to fill you in on what that is. A putrid drop, um, he's saying, Akiva, this Rabbi Akiva is saying, uh, it's a drop of semen. You come from a drop of semen. And even though at the time of conception it's not spoiled, as it does not become spoiled in the womb of the woman until after three days, and then it's spoiled and it's no longer fit to fertilize. Nonetheless, he called it a spoiled drop because it's close to spoiling immediately when it's outside of the innards of the woman. And one who keeps his eye on that which he came from, a putrid drop, will be saved from pride. And one who keeps his eye on that which he is destined to go to a place of dust, worms, and maggots will be saved from desire and from lust for money. And one who keeps his eye on that which he is destined to give an account and a reckoning will separate himself from sin and will not stumble in iniquity. I mean, this is the cure for everything. Lust for money, gambling, desire. Uh, maybe you want to commit adultery or musar. Staying in Torah, learning about Hashem and the Jewish community and what Hashem requires from everyone in the world, 
that's going to keep you busy. And you're not going to have a desire to have those lust for money, women, men, drugs, um, whatever the thing is, is going to keep your eye on the prize. Okay. Which is getting to know Hashem. Okay, so the second Mishnah, Rabbi Hanania, the vice, I almost said the vice president, the vice high priest, you don't see that too often, do you? He said, pray for the welfare of the government for, oh, did I read all this stuff from? Yeah. Pray for the welfare of the government, for if it were not for the fear that it inspires, every man would swallow his neighbor alive. Pray for the welfare of the government, for were it not for the fear it inspires, every man would swallow his neighbor alive. This is a really interesting um, Mishnah. Let's check it out. So, um, Rab Bartanura wants to talk about praying for the welfare of the government specifically. That means even that of the nations of the world. So, these ethics are really um, written for Jews for Jews, <laughs> basically. And um, so, Rab Bartanura says... I think that the sage, Rabbi Hanania, is also talking about even those nations of the world. Pray for their governments, too. Um, and he wants to now comment on the part about swallowing his neighbor alive. As it is written in Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 14, And you make man like the fish of the sea, just like the fish of the sea, each one that is bigger than his fellow swallows his fellow, so that two people, so, so, so two people, were it not for the fear of the government, each one who's bigger than his fellow would swallow the fellow. And you get, uh, you can drill down a little bit more into that in Abu Dazara 4a in the Bavli. Sforno says, pray for the welfare of the government because if the people did not fear the government, although the king may at times be unworthy, as was often the case in the Second Temple era, to the extent that he may rob and plunder his subjects, Nonetheless, it's fitting to pray for his welfare, for then he will instill fear of his authority on them, and he will not consent that the people steal from one another. In that manner, he eliminates violence among the masses. He doesn't want the people to steal from each other. He wants to steal from the people. So why would he let somebody else get in on that? I mean, I'm not. I'm sure that's not what he meant. But, but anyway, so Rav Pelkovitz, who is the author of putting together the Sforno commentary, he always breaks stuff down so it's a little bit even easier to understand what the Sforno is saying. He says, there are many scholars that believe in the Sforno's reference to kings in the Second Temple era is a euphemism. So he's saying, when Sforno is saying the part where it says, um, although a king may at times be unworthy, as was often the case in the Second Temple era, Rav Pelkovitz is saying many scholars believe that the Sforno's reference to kings in the simple, Second Temple era is a euphemism for rulers who reigned in his day. And he remember, he's like 1500s. Um, this, this, is, uh, this is from first, first century, the, the, the Pirkei Avot. However, since freedom of expression in the Middle Ages was not e overly tolerated, he tactfully used the euphemistic phrase, kings in the simple, second temple era. This instruction of Hanina, Hanina is in keeping with the Sforno's attitude regarding respect for authority, especially in the diaspora, which he espouses in his commentary on the Torah. For example, in Sforno's commentary on Exodus 22, 27, he states, the evil which befalls the king in most cases caused great evil and harm to the community as well. And his commentary regarding Abimelech in Genesis 26.10 states, When the leader is punished, great harm befalls those who find protection under his wing. So the Sforno echoes those sentiments here by asserting that any government, even an evil one, is preferable to an anarchy. And here in the U.S., we've not really experienced anarchy but um, if you've ever seen the movie The Purge, that looks something like it. It's, just, it's crazy. Lawlessness. Every man does what he thinks is right. It's crazy. Okay. Um, we're going to read the second half of this Mishnah. It comes from Rav Hanania ben Teradion. And he says, if two sit together, there are, and there, if two people sit together and there's no words of Torah spoken between them, then this is a session of scorners. As it is said, nor sat he at the table of the scornful. Rather, the teaching of the Lord is his delight. And you see that it's one of the first Psalms you see. Psalm 1, chapter, Psalm, 
the first Psalm chapter, uh, verse one. I don't know why I keep wanting to say chapter. You see it right there talking about King David. But if two sit together and there are words of Torah spoken between them, then the Shekinah, the Shekinah, abides among them, as it is said. Then they that feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord hearkened and heard, and a book of remembrance was remembrance was written before him. For them that fear the Lord and that thought upon his name. Malachi 3, verse 16. Malachi chapter 3, verse 16. For them that thought upon his name. He has a book of remembrance where he writes down that those that thought on his name or those that were together in a group and were speaking of Torah and un trying to understand better of Hashem and his ways. Wow. So Sforno says... Uh, if two sit together and there's no words of Torah between them, no words of Torah, Torah between them, then this is a session of scorners. Even though no words of scorn are exchanged, <clears throat> still, since their interchange is entirely devoid of Torah, it's considered a session of scorners, for its nature is empty and meaningless. He brings a proof to this thesis from the verse in, in Psalms 1-1, he being Rab Hananiah, is bringing a proof where it's written the praises of the men of the praises of man that are excuse me ugh, the praises of man are that he walked not in the counsel of the wicked so the praise of man he, that he didn't walk in the counsel of the wicked but and he stood not in the path of the sinful and sat not in the session of scorners but his desires in the Torah of Hashem that is to say that every session is considered a session of scorners unless Words of God's Torah are spoken. And you can read that um, in First Psalm, that first verse. You'll see exactly what David is wanting to call Hashem's attention to. I did not sip these people. I was not with this. I did not uh, pass them by. Now, I want to do something real quick um, just to help us out. Because we think of scorners in one way, fools in another way, and things of this nature. But Israel has different definitions of things. Because everything for Israel is defined from the Torah, or defined by the Torah. So it's not the same way where we're kind of just saying something like, maybe uh, they're scornful of life or something in general. Their stuff usually has, a, it's relative to the Torah. So I'm going to use um, Art Scroll Mishle again. I know you saw this before. So I'll be using Art Scroll Mishle. They have uh, Proverbs, sorry. They have a little introduction that I really like, and I wanted to read to you a paragraph from it where it speaks on um, the simpleton, the scoffer, and the fool because this is something that you see quite often in uh, Mishle Proverbs because uh, King Solomon is speaking of these different people and sometimes he'll pair them against each other or he'll have a wise person versus a foolish person a simpleton versus so let's see what they how they describe it these three uncomplimentary terms simpleton scoffer and fool have different connotations the Malbum explains as follows a simpleton is easily swayed toward evil ways because he lacks the understanding to accept hokma or wisdom and reject the evil inclination. Later in Mishle, we learn that uh, a credulous person believes everything. And that's in uh, chapter 14, verses 15. A scoffer, so a credulous person means uh, believes everything. So that's your simpleton. A scoffer mocks wisdom because it cannot be proven through logic. This is a scoffer. Let's say scoffer. Scoffer? Scoffer. Yeah, it's scoffer. Um, they mock wisdom because it can't be proven through logic, but he does not hate logic. Or excuse me, he does not hate the wisdom. He just mocks it because it cannot be proven through logic. However, since he mocks anything that is based on faith alone, he lacks fear of God. And the only key that can unlock the portals of, and hence he, the only key that can unlock the portals of godly wisdom, which is faith. So you see how the simpleton uh, he 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 doesn't even understand to accept wisdom. The uh, scoffer, he doesn't like wisdom, even though he he doesn't hate it. He just lacks a fear. Um, uh, he lacks a fear of God, and 
therefore he doesn't understand how wisdom works so because he thinks everything should be logical and then you have the last one a fool they know hokma he knows wisdom but he is not deficient in his ability to understand it so he actually can understand wisdom but he rejects it because it demands that he not indulge in his every desire he is worse than a scoffer because he despises hokma um so according to the Vilna Gaon, so you see that you see how the um Jew, the Jews descri- describe these things as fool. They actually understand wisdom, but he would rather indulge in himself and his worldly pleasures. That's what makes him a fool. Um okay, according to the Vilna Gaon, the three groups represent the three main reasons that people don't study Torah. Simpletons have been enticed by their evil inclination to abandon Torah in favor of worldly pleasure. They believe that this will always be the true good. Scoffers neglect Torah because of their love for idle talk, jokes, stories, gossip, irony, and the whole gamut of useless and harmful talk that comes under the heading of scoffing and mockery. Even though this affords them no physical pleasure, it is sweet to them and they covet it. Fools resist the diligence needed to study Torah properly. They want Torah knowledge to be bestowed upon them spontaneously without any effort on their part when they see that they are not becoming instant torah scholars they abandon their study because they fail to appreciate the sweetness of learning okay um uh, rabbeinu yona states that the mitzvah of giving reproof applies mainly regarding the simpleton and the youth but not to the scoffer or the fool because they are generally not generally not open to accepting such constructive criticism so i just wanted you to see that a lot of times in Israel, things where we think they're, they, the word means this, it means something else. And it's usually related to, it's always related to the Torah. I, I don't, that's the best way I can say it. This is an uh, art scroll. Uh, it's from the Ketuvim, the writings. And um, this is Proverbs. And it's, uh, you can get each book of the, the Bible individually um you can get the whole set but this is it has wonderful commentary so if you can if you have the opportunity check it out okay so now that we have that out the way okay let's read this again so uh because now we're going to go into the second part we set we read about two that sit together and there's no words of torah that's spoken between them um then this is a session of scorners, and it said, Nor sat he in the seat of the scornful, rather the teaching of the Lord is his delight, in Psalm 1-1. But if two do sit together, and there are words of Torah spoken between them, then the Shekinah abides among them, as it is said. Then they that fear the Lord spoke with one another, and the Lord hearkened and heard, and a book of remembrance was written before him. And for them that feared the Lord, and that thought upon his name. And Rab Bartanura wants to talk about, Then they that feared the Lord spoke with one another. He says, behold, there are, the, there are two here that this verse is speaking about, two people. But Sforno says, but if the two sit together and words of Torah are between them, divine, the divine presence is between them, Shekinah. Even though the main topic of their conversation is not Torah, nonetheless, the divine presence is between them. Through this instruction regarding the extremes resulting from this disparate behaviors, these disparate behaviors, the Tanaim teach us that the importance of, and worth of such behavior in order to inspire the masses also to follow the right way. So Sforno is saying that a lot of times the, uh, um, that, you know, like it's a session of scorners if you don't talk about the Torah, you have a conversation, you're talking about the light bill and, and how you're going to pay for the light bill, and but there's no Torah in there. And Sforno is saying a lot of times the, um, the rabbis, the sages used you know, a little bit scare tactics to keep people in line so that they don't, they stay on the right path. Though he sit alone and meditate in stillness, let's see. Uh, that's when he, let's see, when thought upon his name. Um, it is a term used to, uh, use, related to the usage of kol de mama de ka. A still small voice as a way of one who learn who learns alone is to learn while whispering. 
The next part, though he sit alone and meditate in stillness um, and silent vayadom, it's a term related to the usage of, oh, who, one who learns alone is, is to learn while whispering. And this is interesting part too, because um, when you're in synagogue and you're saying the prayers, even this, like, it sounds like it's silent, but you're supposed to even like whisper a little bit. Um, because the power for the Jews that's in their voice when they come together. So that makes sense that even while you're learning alone, you should be like reading a little bit aloud, whispering when you're reading the passages. Yeah, he takes a reward unto himself. You get that from Lamentations chapter 3, verse 28. Since he takes a reward for it as if the giving of the entire Torah was for his sake alone. Even if one person sits and occupies, occupies himself um, and with Torah, the Holy One blessed is he determines a reward for him. Uh, hence the Tana says, even if one person sits and occupies himself with Torah, for one person cannot converse on Torah. You can't have a conversation on Torah when you're by yourself. Rather, he must study it. That is, occupy himself with it. Still, he is rewarded for the Tana proves that from that which is written in the verse previous to the one quoted in the Mishnah, it's good for a man that he bear the yoke of Torah like he learns the um, Torah. The proof brought by the Tana from Lamentations 3.28 is unclear unless, as this Forno points out, one reads it in context with the previous verse in chapter 3.27 for Lamentations. So basically, Rab uh, Pelkowitz is saying, verse chapter 3, verse 27 and 28 of Lamentations go together. You can't read it alone. Only then does it become understandable. It teaches that if a person assumes that the yoke of Torah uh, a, a person assumes the yoke of Torah and makes it the guiding force in his life, then even though he studies alone, he will be rewarded. So um, don't think of the yoke as a burden. Think of the yoke that helps the um, animal move forward as they're going down that path. When you have the two yoked together, they go down that path, or it's yoked to something. When it's clearing the field, it's not a burden. It's a help. So that's another thing like for us in Western thought, you hear yoke and you think it's, it sounds awful, but it's not. It's not the same connotation. Um, that's the best way I can say. Okay. Mishnah 3 of uh, chapter 3. So Rabbi Shimon said, if three have eaten at one table and have not spoken three words of Torah, it's as if they had eaten sacrifices offered to the dead. As it is said, for all the tables are full of filthy vomit when the all-present is absent. You get that from Isaiah 28, verse 8. But if three have eaten at the at one table and have spoken three words of Torah, it's as if they had eaten at the table of the all-present. Blessed be he, as it is said, and he said unto me, This is the table before the Lord. And you get that in Ezekiel 41, 22. So... Bartonora said, let me get that part where it says, they have not spoken their words of Torah. On this side. He said, and they didn't say upon the table any words of Torah. And with the grace after meals that we bless upon the table, we fulfill our obligation. So you can say about whatever you want to. When we say, because um, Jews say the blessing, they say a blessing before. And they, they say blessings all the time. <laughs> so you get one before and one after. Uh, when they do the benching, so when you, because you're saying the blessing, it's just, it's considered as if you said words of Torah upon Torah upon the table. So so I've heard. That's what Pratanora says. Uh, from the offerings of the dead. So if you if you if you're at the table and you didn't speak words of Torah, it's as if you had eaten sacrifices offered to the dead. So Rab Bartanora says this means the sacrifices of idol worship, as it is written in Psalm 106. Verse 28, and they became attached to Baal Peor, and they ate from the offerings of the dead. Okay, so, for all tables are full of filthy vomit when the all-present is absent. So he says, Rab Bartonor says, full of vomit and feces, and idol worship is called feces, as is stated in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 22. Feces shall you say to him. Excuse me, and... We learned in the Torah part with uh, Balak, Balak that when um, Balaam taught, uh, told the Moabite women, he told 
Balaam to tell his Moabite, Moabite women to go down down there and, uh, you know, entice the Is Israelite men. And they brought with them their gods. And you can see from the sages, it was saying that they, they actually had the, the guys bowing down to their gods. And the way you worship this particular god was you took a dump in front of the god. And that's how that worked. Okay. Um, so this idea of feces and idol worship is not anything new. Please go to Baal, uh, Torah Parsha Balak and Bamidbar Numbers. Um, I can't remember the chapter right now. And you will see it from the sages. When, when on the part where the women start mingling with the, the Israeli men, Israelite men. Okay, Bartinoa, Rabbi Bartinoa wants to talk about uh, when the omnipresent is absent or the all-present is absent. It means because they did not mention the name of the omnipresent, may he be blessed upon the table. So the English explanation of this is Rabbi Shimon's first statement is based on a pun on the verse in Isaiah. The little trans literal translation of the verse according to the, uh, the JPS Bible is, Yea, all the tables are covered with vomit and filth so that no space is left. The word so that no space is left can also be interpreted to mean when the all-present is absent. For the word for all present and space are one and the same. It's the word makom. Sacrifices to the dead are how Rabbi Shimon interprets the word filthy vomit. The reason that he assumes that this is three is that a communal meal must have three people. This is also the minimum number that must be gathered in order to do a communal grace after meals. The birkat hamazon. Okay. Now... Uh, but if three have eaten at one table and have spoken their words of Torah, is if they had eaten at the table of the all present, blessed be he as it is said. In Ezekiel 41, 22, he said unto me, this is the table before the Lord. As it is said in Ezekiel 41, 22, and he said to me, this is the table that is before the Lord. Immediately when he speaks words of Torah, it is called a table that is before the Lord, a shulchan. Um, and... Some say that it comes out from the beginning of the verse that is written. The altar is three amot. Do not read it as amot, but emot, mothers or foundations, like ima, uh, emot, sorry. As in, there is foundation or priority to how a verse is written. Three corresponds to Torah, prophets, and writings. And some say to scripture, mish, to, some say scripture, Mishnah, and Talmud meaning that a person must speak about them over the table. And then it is called a table that is before the Lord, so explains Rashi. So the Sforano talks about this uh, entire Mishnah, and he says, food prepared and consumed exclusively, exclusively to sustain physical life, which is transitory and perishable, is called offerings to the dead idols. Now it is proper to consider the difference between such a table of purpose as is as mentioned above, and the table of the Holy One. Blessed is he, blessed is he that is. His table is the altar, which is the table on high from which the priests eat. For their food consumption is marked by sanctity, and the goal is to reach eternal perfection and completeness. Compare to this table, uh, compare this table, this the table serving, and the purpose of physical pleasure alone, it's, it's called, the physical pleasure is called full of vomit and filth. As the prophet states in Isaiah 28, verses 7 through 8. And though strong drinks, um, and though strong drink, the priest and the prophet are, uh, excuse me, and through strong drink, the priest and prophet are confused. All the table is full of vomit and filth. Meaning that when the table, and you have to read Isaiah chapter 28, verses 7 through 8 to understand what this mission is saying. Meaning that when the table is used only for vain and passing pleasure, the priest's heir and Torah and the prophet's prophetic power is impaired. The Tana contrasts this kind of table with one which is before Hashem, such a table akin to an altar, and it is though one is eating from the table of the Holy One, blessed is he. And the Tana has already taught in the previous Mishnah, if two sit together and words of Torah are between them, the divine presence is between them as well. So I just want to quick turn to 28 so we can see what's going on here. So we're going to read Isaiah 28, uh, Pasuk 7 and 8. But they also have erred through wine and through strong drink. 
Um, and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet. I was wondering who erred. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink and they are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They can't even have their prophetic uh, sight. They stumble in judgment. So in the courtroom, they're messing up people's um, people sentencing and, and judgments and stuff. For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness so that there is no place clean. So we see the Isaiah's talking about leadership here. So that's why they, they have all this, what they're talking about here with the uh, table. and Okay, so we got that one straight. Let's go to the uh, fourth Mishnah. Rabbi Hananiah ben Hahinia says, One who wakes up at night or walks on the way alone and turns his heart to idle matters, behold, this man is mortally guilty. Do you suffer from a restless night's sleep? Let's see what the sages say about it. Bartonur on Pirkei Avot, he says, He who stays awake at night and who wanders the road alone, and thinks, meaning he thinks about idle things in his heart. And we learn now that if you ain't thinking about Torah, Hashem, or whatever you want to, something a sage said or something like that, it is idle. <laughs> Sforno says, one who stays awake at night or one who travels alone on the road and turns his heart to idleness, indeed he bears guilt for his soul. So when you're uh, awake at night and you can't go to sleep, you might want to pick up your Bible and read some things or pick up your peer king of vote and read some things um, so that you're not idle so you don't bear guilt for your soul for mi mis uh, appropriating your time to idle things when you could use that time to study things about Hashem after the author of this Mishnah Rav uh, Hanania he discusses various actions representing all areas of alertness and diligence uh, requires of men while you sit in your home that is in your study room and around your table like we're doing he now directs our attention to the type of alertness required while you walk on the way and when you retire okay um behold this man is mortally guilty rab martinora so let me take that this one is liable for forfeiture of his life as night is the time of demons and one who wanders on a road alone is in danger because of the brigands um, and several other bad occurrences. And if he had been thinking about words of Torah, he would, it would have guarded him. Sforno says, Now this wise sage tells us one who stays awake at night and one who travels alone on the road, therefore are not distracted by anyone who di would divert him to idle things, is one who can turn away his heart from mundane matters and is therefore at lib liberty to contemplate. But if these free moments are squandered for naught, then he bears guilt for his soul for these moments which are free from the demands of duties of everyday life and it's a time to do a time it's and a time to do for Hashem Psalms 119 and 120 119 verse 126 to consider God's works and his Torah and to contemplate upon how to revive one's soul which is a type of Musar too if however he is lax and fails to use these moments then indeed he bear, he bears guilt for his soul not saying anything different than we said before. Um, you are held accountable for moments when you're free from your worldly um, day, which is nighttime. Um, <clears throat> and when you're traveling or something like that, you don't have to tend to the normal day to day. And when you're, you're preparing for bed, that's your time to wind down. So why not think about Hashem or pick something up and read about him um, instead of scrolling... <laughs> We all know, we all do it. Mission of five. Mm, good ice. Okay. Rabbi Nehania, Rabbi Hanania ben Hanania says, whoever takes upon himself the yoke of Torah, they remove from him the yoke of the government and the yoke of worldly concerns. And whoever breaks off from himself the yoke of Torah, they place upon him the yoke of government and the yoke of worldly concerns. So if you take on the yoke of Torah to, that takes you down the path, then your worldly concerns, the government, all those things will be taken care of because you're putting emphasis on the things that matter. However, on the converse, 
whoever breaks himself off from the Torah, now what will get placed on him are the worries of the government and other uh, your other worldly concerns. So Rav Bartonora says, the yoke of government means the burden placed upon him by the king and ministers. Taxes, I don't know, whatever. Um, also, he wanted to speak on the way of the world. Let me see. And the worldly concerns. The derech eretz. Meaning the toil and strain of a livelihood. He's released from this because his work becomes blessed when, when he focuses on the Torah. Um, how Hashem does that? It is possible. It is possible. I've seen some things in my own life when you change your focus uh, to focus more on Hashem and the things of Hashem and His Word and change your life around, you will see change. It will make your load of life easier. Bartonora says, the, and one who casts from himself the yoke of Torah, it means one who says the yoke of Torah is too hard and I can't endure it. So we're talking about this gentleman here. The yoke of worldly responsibilities and securing protection. Um, oh, sorry. So he says, uh, oh yeah, he says, the yoke of Torah is too hard, I can't even endure it. But Sforno says, but if someone throws off the, um, the yoke of Torah uh, for himself, the yoke of the government and the yoke of worldly responsibilities are placed on him. So you're going to bear somebody's yoke. It's just which one do you prefer? The yoke of worldly responsibilities, Forno says, and securing protection from life's vicissitudes. It, te it teaches us, Rav Hanani is teaching us oops, that when one who has accepted the yoke of Torah casts it off, that is, one who studied and left, he will be burdened with the yoke of government, as it says, because you did not serve Hashem, who will serve your enemies. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 47 through 48. And the yoke of worldly responsibilities will also be his, as it says, in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness. Mm. That's Deuteronomy chapter 28, 48. Okay. Mishnah 6. Let's read that. That's Rabbi Halafta. Uh, of Kefir Hanania said, when ten sit together and occupy themselves with Torah, the Shekinah abides among them, as it is said, God stands in the congregation of God. How do we know that the, that's Psalms, uh, oops, 8, 82, verse 1? How do we know that the same is true even of five? As it is said, the band of his he has established on earth, Amos chapter 9, verse 6. How do we know that the same is true even of three? As it said, in the midst of the judges, he judges. Psalm 82, verse 1. How do we know that the same is true even of two? Does this sound like Abraham uh, bargaining for Lot? As it is said, when they that fear the Lord spoke with one another, and how the Lord hearkened and heard, Malachi 3, 6. How do we know the same is true even of one? As it is said, in every place where I cause my name to be mentioned, I will come unto you and bless you. Ten who, who are sitting in judgment, Bartonor says, it's a textual variant we follow. Uh, in the congregation of God, here, he says, um, the, and there is no congregation or edah that is less than 10, as it is stated with the 12 scouts in Numbers 14, 27. Until when will this evil congregation, and that means there are the 10, uh, the 12 spies subtracting out Yehoshua or Joshua and Caleb, behold, you get 10. So that's where the 10 the minion and everything he's saying comes from this idea from numbers not from something else um you may have seen i think uh some people will quote zacharia but this is the this is where you get the 10. um bartonora uh, is also commenting on and from where is there proof that it is true even when there are only five as it is said in Psalms 82, 1, in the midst of judges, he judges. Three judges, in the midst of judges, he judges. Three judges and two litigants. That's how you get five. So, again, this might not be how our court works. This is how the court, that's the Bay's Den, the Beit Den in Israel. They got to have three. And you always got a complainer and a defendant, right? A plaintiff and a defendant. So, and always three judges. So that's, again... It's the you we might be reading the same word, but it ain't the same way. So that's Baruch Hashem for the, the sages helping us understand how Israel works. Okay, and from where even three 
There you go. Uh, as it is said, and he has founded his band upon the earth. Fire and air and water, which are three. He's founded upon the earth as they surround the fundamental element of earth. Behold to you, three are called a band. And also another explanation is, we have found that three are called a band with a band of hyssop, which are three stalks. And some books have written in them, from where is there proof that, that this is true, even when there are only five? Um, as it is said in Amos 9, 6, and he has founded his band upon the earth. As a, ba a man bands together things into his one hand, which has five fingers, and so the group of fingers in the hand is called a band. And in the beginning of the verse, it states, he who builds his upper chambers in the heavens, which is to say the divine presence, which is in the heavens, comes down to the earth when there is a band there that is involved with Torah. And the continuation of this textual variant is, from even where three, as it is said in Psalms 82, verse 1, in the midst of the judges, he judges. So just even in the judges, boom, he's there. Okay, since he takes, let's see. Uh, okay, since he takes my towel for it. Um, and so Rabbi Bartonor is talking about expression of covering, the Aramaic translation of Exodus 43, and you will cover is vitatel, which is to say the divine presence hovers upon him. So now he's, he's kind of actually talking into um, how the Shekhinah abides amongst the ten, five, three, one. It's a, a type of hovering, he's saying. Um, and uh, the rabbi looked at the Aramaic translation. And Aramaic is a biblical language. There are several books in the Bible um, that are written in Aramaic. So this is a legal move. Legal move to look in the Aramaic. Sparno, if 10 people sit together and, and engage in Torah study, the divine presence dwells amongst them. How do we know this even of three, even of two? And engage in Torah. Above in Mishnah 3, the Tana refers to people who discuss their mundane effort, affairs and intersperse words of Torah in their discussion. He tells us that the divine presence is between them. Here, however, Rabbi Halakta uh, speaks of those who engage in Torah and about them he says the divine presence dwells amongst them. The Talmud teaches us that if two are engaged in the study of Torah, it is recorded in the book of remembrance. However, if only one, then it's not recorded. And we get that from Bahot 6b in the Babli. As for three, though they are engaged <coughs> in deciding the law, remember the three is what the three judges for the based in the court. Three, though they are engaged in deciding the law and dispensing justice, it's still considered that they're engaged in Torah, because this is, that's where the law is. For the law process is also equal to Torah. As for a group of 10, we're taught 10 who convene to engage in Torah, the divine presence precedes them. And if there are three, the divine presence joins them once they have convened. Um, how do, and, and, I know in synagogues, you'll see often, especially if it's a small congregation, if they don't have the 10 men, they don't bring the Torah out. So that number 10 is important because that's how many they need to bring the Torah out of the ark. And you know how they, they'll march it around. It's, it's a wonderful time. But if you got a small congregation, okay, how do we know this even of five? The number five mentioned here is in the Mishnah is not cited in the Talmud as a distinct unit. However, it may be that Rabbi... Halafta equated them with 10. If their gathering from the outset was for the purpose of engaging, engaging in Torah, that is why they are designated as a bundle. So Rav Pelkovitz wants to speak a little bit more on that. He says the Teferit Yisrael commentary on this particular Mishnah suggests that the number five is included by the Tana, the Tanaim, because five judges sit on the court, which makes the measurement from the murder victim to the closest city to determine who is obligated to bring the axed calf. What is that talking about? The blood guilt of an accident um, of a of a uh, un, um, not undisclosed, but a unsolved mystery murder. You'll get that in Deuteronomy 21. I believe that's what they're referring to. You need five judges to figure out what's going on with that case. So Sforno says, how do we know that you get the, um, the Shekhinah to abide among just one person studying Torah? As for one who engages in Torah, the Tana and Mishnah, Three bought proof from the verse in Lamentations that his reward is greater than that of two who sit together. The words of Torah are between them. 
The Tana of our Mishnah adds that the divine presence is with him when he is occupied with Torah as it is written. I will come to you. Exodus 20, verse 21. Now, what does this mean for Goyim, for us Gentiles that sit and we study Torah? We don't necessarily have the benefit of being in a congregation, a Jewish congregation, and getting the benefit of the rabbi. I don't know. I don't know if the Shekhinah is with us or not, but I know one thing. All men must choose Hashem. And um, he gives you free will to choose away from him, and he gives you free will to choose toward him. I'm going to choose toward him, and we can figure the rest out later. <laughs> okay. Next slide. Mishnah 7. So, Rabbi Eli Elazar of Bartotha said, Give to him of that which is his, Hashem. For you and that which is yours is his, and thus it says with regards to David, for everything comes from you, and from your own hand we have given you. First Chronicles 29, 14. Um, and then also uh, Rabbi Yaakov, Jacob said, if one is studying while working on the road and interrupts his study and says, how fine is this tree? Or how fine is this newly plowed field? Scripture accounted to him as if he were mortally guilty. They said, no, thank you. All right, let's see what this means. So let's focus on the one that give to him what is his. Rabbi Bartonora says, do not prevent yourself from being involved in matters of heaven, whether your body or whether with your money, as you are not giving from yours, not from your body and not from your money, as you and your money are Hashem's. And as far as walking down the street and you're thinking about Torah and you see a pretty tree or a pretty field and you comment on it and break your concentration, Rabbi Bartonora says, this is true of all idle talk. But it is speaking according to what is common, as if, as it is the way of wayfarers to speak about what they see with their eyes. And some say that it comes to make us understand a novelty, that even though through this, he will make the blessing. Blessed is he who is like this in his world. Nonetheless, scripture considers it as if he were liable for his life because he interrupted his study. That's hardcore. But we're going to take what um, the sage said a little bit earlier, Sforno. It says, sometimes the sages will be hard on us to keep us on the right way. I'm going to take that. So Rai Bartonora also talks about a newly plowed field, a, a way to say that in Hebrew is near, and the, <clears throat> the furrow of a plow, as in Jeremiah 4.3. Plow for yourselves a furrow. Sforno says, I don't really know what that means, what he's saying there, but Sforno says, give him from his own, for you and your possessions are his, although it's written, what does Hashem your God ask of you? That's Deuteronomy 10.12. He's not asking that you give him that which belongs to you, that you should think you have the right to legally refuse him, for you and your possessions are his. Therefore, he is entitled to ask anything of you, and if you should refuse, you would be guilty of withholding what is his. And consider this, he is the judge, and he is the plaintiff. Mic drop. Okay. Um, now, Sporno wants to address the part where... You're meditating, you're walking on the road, reviewing your Torah lesson, but you interrupt, interrupt your review and you see a pretty tree or whatever, and now you are bearing guilt for your soul. One who does not bear guilt for his soul unless he sits idly and through a lack of concentration and review removes from them his consciousness. And through the lack of con concentration and review, he removes them from his consciousness. Behold, one who interrupts his study of Torah and diverts his attention to secular matters and also he who removes the words of Torah from his heart, both of these are included in the admonition. Uh, and according to, uh, Rab Pelkovitz wants to kind of expound a little bit further. He says, Rabbi Yaakov's reference to, and Rabbi Yaakov is here, Rabbi Jacob, his reference is to one who walks on the road while reviewing a Torah lesson but interrupts his review it's a metaphor for those who interrupt their Torah study in order to pursue secular studies. Torah is the way of life, the road we are meant to follow, while the wisdom of the world is represented by the beautiful trees and pleasant, bountiful fields. The Sforno explains why the expression, he bears guilt for his soul, is used by both the Rabbi uh, Yaakov and Rabbi Dostai. That will be a uh, mission that we get to uh, next time. But this teaches that a person who interrupts his Torah studies in order to pursue secular knowledge 
is equivalent to one who lets his Torah fade from his memory. Um, that's what the sages say. Don't know. Uh, that is a big machloket, even to this day, of what that necessarily means. Back in the day, the idea was, were, are Jews allowed to study um, Greek wisdom? Um, let me see. And does that take away from, does that take away from, this book talks about that a lot. That'll be another one I'll review. <laughs> it's called A Cure for Sorrow, A Rabbinic Guide to Suffering. The idea that um, if, if we learn the wisdom of the Greeks, which is a, a really interesting wisdom, we take time away from Torah study, then we learn, so we are putting our, uh, all our strength in secular studies, and what good is that? And at the end of the day, you gotta still do Torah and things of this nature. So even to this day, do Jews, should they uh, participate in the sciences? Um, should they participate in, you know, thing, things that are helpful to mankind? Um, you know, along with your Torah study, doctors, lawyers, I mean, how far do you go with this? So this to this day is, is still a, a big question. So if you ever hear of that idea, just know you can actually see it play by play in the Pirkei Avot, uh, which this is, Pirkei Avot is like first century. So what are we in? 20, <laughs> 2024. So they've been arguing about this for 2024 years. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah. Okay. So that is Mishnah 7. Um, this is our last slide here. You know, I'm hoping you're enjoying this. And I hope that you will consider purchasing the commentary, uh, the Sforno commentary on Pierre K. Avot from artschool.com. They also have other commentaries on Pierre K. Avot. Um, Art School never leaves you hanging. I can't think of one thing they publish where they don't have some kind of commentary of something. So there's a, a com there's a peer care vote that's I think it's maybe ten bucks, and it's a little thing. It's a nice little starter peer care vote if maybe Sforno is too much. It's still got some commentary, and they do not leave you hanging. So that's a, one reason why I like Art School. You're always gonna have somebody saying something to help you out. You're always gonna have a rabbi on deck um, to help us because we don't think the way Israel is taught to think. So. Uh, do check that out. You know your uh, safaria.org. Um, and yeah, that's it. So thank you for joining. Please, I get so many things wrong. We're new here. We're just trying to, with our Hebrew and everything, just put it down in the comments. Put the reference where we can find the correct thing. And, and, and let's have some discussion about that. And let's keep it moving. We're here to learn and help Israel out any way we can for them to perform their mitzvot. But first, we kind of got to understand what's going on because how can you really help somebody if you don't really know what they got going on there? So um, see you next time. And uh, just thanks for making this community grow.